Let me enter into this conversation by giving a historical context. In the month of May 1963, the leaders of the then independent African countries assembled in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And many speeches were delivered and the thrust of all the speeches was that African countries having regained their independence, their primary focus and objective was to ensure that they exercise their regained mandate for the benefit of the people to ensure uh, that the people were liberated from ignorance, disease, and poverty. On the 24th day of May, perhaps the most powerful speech ever made by an African leader was delivered by Ghana's Kwame Nkrumah. And he reminded the leaders who were present on that day about a number of things. One. He told them that not to delude themselves, that by regaining their independence, the erstwhile colonizer would recoil and remain inactive. That in fact, the erstwhile colonial master was going to be more pernicious, but in a very subtle way. Kwame Nukuruma was right. He reminded his audience that going forward, it was necessary and indeed urgent that Africans should begin to think as one whole because if they remained in disunity, they would remain weak and vulnerable and therefore susceptible to manipulation. Kwame Nkrumah was right. He reminded his audience that because many of, if not all, of the African countries were artificial, they were created in Berlin, and the boundaries were artificial, but he urged his audience that they should respect the inviolability of the boundaries because if they tried to redraw the boundaries, conflict would never end. And that was reinforced in 1964 in Cairo on the doctrine of inviolability of inherited boundaries. I remind us of this particular incident 58 years ago because in 2013, the African Union came with Agenda 2063. And if you look at the text of Agenda 2063, and the speeches that were given around it, it was the rehash of what Kwame spoke about and the other leaders spoke about. And it's not lost on me last year that one of the themes of African Union was the silencing of the guns by the year 2020. I'm not a Jewish prophet, but the guns will not be silent next year. <coughs> in fact, there are more guns that are emerging in Africa which means that peace is still very elusive. And then we have been given the history. The founding fathers of the African countries took the view that because we are states made out of many nations, there was wisdom in having a style of politics that was different so that in the early days of many African countries, many leaders held the view. Whether they were mistaken or not is another debate for another day. But they held the view that one of the things that they had to do was to have single party states. So that if you went to Zaire then or Congo before it became Zaire or Zambia or Malawi or Kenya or Uganda or Tanzania, Everybody believed that in order to hold the many nationalities together, you needed a single party under whose aegis 
organization of state affairs would be undertaken. Mistakes were made. And then the conceptual West convinced us that our salvation could only come from something they call democracy. And I'm using the word very deliberately, something they call democracy, which they defined. And they defined it in English, if you are colonized by the English, and they defined it in French, if you are colonized by the French, and they defined it in Portuguese, if you are colonized by the Portuguese, and they defined it in Spanish, if you are colonized by the Spaniard. We never defined it in Kinyarwanda, no. It was never defined in Igbo or Yoruba. And we were told after the collapse of the Soviet Union that democracy was equals to one, multi-party politics, two, periodic elections, three, limitation of terms of the presidency. That is how the conceptual West defined it for us. And we who have had the advantage, if it is an advantage at all, of being educated in the West, there is a sense in which our thought processes are also confined by those definitions. However much we want to free ourselves, we find our default mode being how we were trained. So when we define democracy, we are also caught up in this box. Sometimes we tell ourselves to think outside of the box, but the true north of our thought processes still remains the box. We never think without the box. <laughs> so when we talk about peace in Africa, and we talk about adversarial politics. We are not talking about anything that is African. The political party is not African. It is something that we inherited. You know, in the United Kingdom, they talk about the loyal opposition, loyal to the monarchy. Because there is a process. Permit me to say at this stage that Africa deals with uh, diversity much better than Europe. Much better. If you look at your typical European nation, the Dutch is the Dutch, largely. The Swedes are the Swedes, largely. The Norwegians are the Norwegians, largely. The Finns are the Finns, largely. And where they have many ethnicities, they don't do very well. Ask the Spaniards if you doubt me. Where they had many nations in Yugoslavia, ask them. They created many nations to create pure ethnicities. But African nations have succeeded thus far in working with diversity in very unique circumstances where the conceptual West, despite their protestation to the contrary, are always interfering in our affairs in a very subtle manner. When we are holding election, they will deny it. But there is a way in which they are always moving in a subterranean fashion. Because the, the, the thesis still is that you divide them in order to rule them. That is the thesis. We don't say it as loudly as we should because we want to be politically correct and I refuse to be correct. And this is exactly what Kwame Nkrumah warned us about. And the political party therefore lends itself to that manipulation. We will be persuaded, because it is us who have gone to school who form political parties, we will be persuaded to form outfits. And in many African countries, these outfits are formed on the basis of ethnic affiliation. Your typical African political party is simply an assembly of ethnicities. And in many African nations, you will discover that what we call elections is simply an ethnic census to determine which ethnic group is larger than the other. It is, Kwame, it is Julius Nyerere of Tanzania who said it. He said that the tragedy of Africa is not what the song is not the song that is being sung, but who the singer is. And what he meant was very clear that you may have an agenda that is good for your nation, but if you do not come from a particular ethnic group, those who will follow you will not be from your ethnic group. You may sing the best song, 
But when you look back, you'll discover that it's only people from your ethnic group who are following you. And when you have such a situation, the design is inherently conflictual. And that is why, therefore, when you look at Africa today, you discover that after every election cycle in many African countries, there is conflict. Because you go into the election or the political parties go into an electoral process on the basis that we must win. And if we don't win, the elections have been rigged. In other words, we place so much premium on the presidency. And you'll see in many African countries, entry into government is like winning a lottery. It is winning a lottery because it gives you access to resources. And therefore, people say, people claim the president. If you are in a country, you say, and one of your own, one of your own means a son. They are normally sons. One of your own sons has won the presidency. The tribe celebrates from the herdsman the herdsman to the professor, from the fisherman to the intellectual, because we have now won the presidency. We have won the lottery. We will have ministers. We'll have all these, and everybody else feels excluded, and that generates conflict. And we have seen it, whether if we don't see it in Gabon, we see it in Guinea-Bissau. If we don't see it in Guinea-Bissau, we see it in Kenya. If we don't see it in Kenya, we see it in South Sudan. So that in South Sudan, if one were to ask them, what is the problem? The contest is of an ethnic kind. They are contesting because one of our own must occupy the state house. And that is why, therefore, you see, under the guise of democracy in a number of African countries, we create offices which are sinecures. You will have a president, you will have a deputy president, you will have a second deputy president, you will have a prime minister, first prime minister, first second prime, all those useless offices which make no sense because you have to appoint people into those offices and give them a motorcade so that when they go to their villages, they look important. And the people own them as ours. People want to be included. In such a scenario, my verdict is number one. Africa's long-term salvation demands that we avoid adversarial politics. Africa's salvation demands that we define for ourselves what democracy means. And you said it very correctly, Professor, and the good uh, friend from the United Kingdom, very correctly, what people want is to participate. What people want is to have a government that is accountable. Many people in many African countries simply want food on the table. Many people in many African countries simply want to have access to health care. Many people simply want good education. Young men and women in Africa simply want opportunities for innovation and invention. And they want a government that creates an, an environment where that can be achieved. And therefore, in my view, I think that time has come that Africa must define herself. One of the problems that we have in Africa is that we do not define ourselves. And permit me to annoy you. In many African nations today, after every election, whether we like it or not, we have observers. And when the elections are being held, observers may come from Nigeria, from Kenya, from Uganda, but people are waiting, what did the European Union say? You know, this belief by us that the Europeans have a divine duty to tell us what to do, and we have a divine duty to accept to do what they say is one of the problems that we have. And until the day that we liberate ourselves to decolonize our minds, in a manner of speaking, we are going to embrace the kind of politics that will only perpetuate conflict. Right now, as I move towards my conclusion, I simply want you to look at the map of Africa. And look at the map of Africa against the declaration that the guns might be silenced by 2020. And simply tell me, is there peace and calm in Niger? Is there peace and calm in Burkina Faso? Do you have peace and calm in Mali? Is it peaceful in Mauritania? Is it peaceful in Benin? Is it peaceful in Gabon? Is it 
peaceful in, 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 uh, in Cameroon? Is it peaceful in South Sudan? Is it peaceful in the Democratic Republic of Congo? Is it peaceful in Somalia? If you look at the map of Africa and you look at that and you are being told through declarations that we are going to silence the guns in 2020. It's as if you are being told to go to Kigali but, and, and meanwhile you have engaged a gear taking you to the Democratic Republic of Congo's border and you are on jet like speed. This, this, this is why I think that it is incumbent upon us to remember one thing, that peace is not merely the absence of war. It is much deeper than that. That de development is not building of skyscrapers in African cities, no. And that therefore, if we want to sustain peace and development, what we must look at are the human indices. I think the Bhutanese have got it right. They, what they call the gross national happiness index. These things that you, Europe tells us many useful things, but there are certainly useless things that they tell us. One of them is the thing called per capita income that they take all the wealth, half of which is owned by two people, and then they divide it and say, the per capita income is $800. And meanwhile, all other people are suffering. I'm submitting to us that time has come that we must define what development is. I want to go to a typical Rwandese village and beyond peace, beyond the absence of war, I want to see peace at the dinner table. I want to see peace at the hospital and the dispensary. And I'm suggesting to us that politics defines all these. And one of the things that we must do, and Professor, I can't agree with you more, is that there is no one size fits all. There is no one size fits all. What works for Rwanda is not necessarily what works for Uganda. In 1984, the Ethiopians came up with a constitution which I think is the only one in the world that allowed, that defines itself on the basis of ethnic identity and even allows the ethnicities to secede under certain conditions. Whether it has worked or not, I think the jury is still out. But they recognize the fact that ethnicities are real. And if we continue to delude ourselves in Africa that ethnicities are unreal, we are cheating ourselves. Even the United States of America nowadays, when you hear them talking about the vote, they, they talk about the Hispanic vote. They talk about the black vote. They talk about the Caucasian vote. They are beginning to recognize that those blocks are critical. How then do you use them in a manner that is positive? Because Look at the Democratic Republic of Congo with over 233 ethnicities. Look at Nigeria with over 200 languages. Look at Kenya with over 56. Look at Tanzania with 136 plus. These are the realities in the African nation. And I am convinced that going forward, number one, we need to have peace. But we will not have peace by declaring that peace will come and reign. We must do things that move us in the direction of attaining peace. And until we introduce what I've called elsewhere hygiene in our politics, we are moving nowhere. And part of the introduction of hygiene is to recognize the environment and the context in which we operate. One of the, move, the areas in which we must move is to recognize that going forward, we are different nations in single states trying to create mega nations. And unless we have inclusivity so that people belong, feel they belong. And I want to give this example. In, in Kenya, it happens, and I believe in other countries. When an individual is elected as a member of parliament, in many African countries, they have things they call homecoming parties. These homecoming parties is an attempt to demonstrate to the village by the newly elected member of parliament or newly appointed minister that we went to hunt. We have come back with a prize. That prize is membership in parliament or a ministerial post. Let us eat and celebrate. 
so that when you want to punish that individual, you are not punishing the holder of the office, but you are punishing the whole village. People own these positions. And I'm suggesting to us that politics must be of such a nature that allows ethnicities and groups to negotiate. I do not as yet have an answer which I think I can pin on the ground, but I have the following things. That it cannot be uniform that it must be specific to the circumstances of each country, that it is us who must define it, and that we must have a vocabulary for it, and that we must warn ourselves that the erstwhile colonial master is alive and well, subterranean and pernicious to the core. Don't delude yourselves. And remember that sometimes the disunity of Africa is big business. And if we forget that, we will once again be manipulated. Lastly, I saw the African National Congress winning an election in South Africa last week. Not that it's a bad thing, but somebody sent me a clip that was very telling. It was a clip where all the celebrants were Chinese, and they were celebrating, hail African National Congress Chinese in in Johannesburg. <laughs> that laughter suggests to me that you have understood my message. <laughs> Thank you. Let me start by warning myself that when I talk about Africa, I'm not blind to the fact that there are 55 African countries. And sometimes it is very easy to assume that I'm talking about a homogeneous thing. It is not. I'm alive to the reality that what I'm saying about Rwanda is not necessarily what I would be saying about Senegal. Mm. But there are certain things that I think are unique to the African nations, and I'm talking about African nations in the narrow sense. So that when we talk about democracy, and I prefer the word accountability, and people's involvement in governance, I'm simply warning ourselves that nobody should define for us what democracy is. If we choose as the people of Rwanda to embrace a governing system that is satisfactory and which the majority of the people think is right, that is our system. We should not be in the business of pleasing others who define for us and have a litmus test which they dip into some democratic uh, bottle and then if it turns green, then we are democratic. I think that if we are alive to that, then we are doing the right thing. And you mentioned Gachacha, which, which in my view defines how when you define yourselves and you do your own things, you achieve better results. If you compare the Arusha Tribunal and Gachacha and what they have achieved, there is no, the difference is between day and light. Day and, and day and night, mm. in terms of what Gashasha achieved within the same time, you look at the expense and what it does to the society. Mm. But I'm quite certain that there were certain uh, legal Puritans from Western capitals who would have frowned upon Gashasha saying, what is this? It is because the people of Rwanda simply said, this is our system. Our people understand it. It's going to repair the damages that have been caused to the extent that is humanly possible. And I'm saying that in our conception of democracy, we can also choose that and pursue that. And if we are sufficiently persistent, people will then begin to recognize that we have governance systems that can work. And it is happening. If you go to Botswana, for example, they have their own system which incorporates what we describe as modern. The other problem we have is that anything African is not modern. So, so I'll use the word modern as understood in this sense. You go to Botswana, you have a house of chiefs because they have recognized that the chieftaincy system has a role to play. You go to, to Malawi or you go to Zambia, they recognize traditional rulers. You go to Nigeria, the same. You go to many parts of West Africa, they recognize that these systems, they are not perfect. Nobody is saying they are perfect, but they have a role to play. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that going forward, we should not ignore them. There are lessons to be learned from them, and I think if we embrace them, perhaps they are going to help us in achieving sustainable mm -hmm. peace. You asked about the neo-colonial project. In my view, and I stand to be corrected on this, I think the neo-colonial project is alive and well. 
It is alive and well in very many subtle ways. A friend of mine asked, and, and this I say to the detriment at the risk of annoying uh, my friend Michel. The Commonwealth, for example, the colonizer knew I'm losing my, 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 my colonies, but I must create something that doesn't look harmful. And this thing is the Commonwealth of my former colonies. So that even when I designate ambassadors, our ambassadors are not called ambassadors, they are high commissioners. The head of the, of the Commonwealth will perpetually be the British monarch. These are very subtle ways. Not saying that there are no benefits to being a part of the Commonwealth, I'm not saying so. But these are subtle ways in which you remain in control of your former colonies. If you go to France, they have the organization for former or French speaking nations and, and they bring you together so that if there is a problem the first port of call if there is a problem in Cote d'Ivoire the first port of call is not Addis Ababa the African Union no it is the former French colonies when you are giving they gain independence you give them a currency the CFA which is regulated from Paris these are very subtle ways and 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 uh, you know, when I look at, because we have gone to school in this system, even the education system is very deliberate. In, when I am thinking as one trained in the English way, my inclination is to think essentially like an English person. And, and, and I think that these are the things that Nkrumah was warning us against. And there are many writings to this effect. I, I want you to read, for, for, for whatever it's worth, just read Ngugi Wath Yongo's Decolonizing the Mind. Ngugi is telling us, learn the ways, because there are beautiful things to be learned from other civilization. But absorb that which is useful to you and discard that which is detrimental. What we have succeeded in doing is that we have learned, and the bad things that are not useful to us are the things that we embrace. So Nkrumah was right in that regard. And, and, and you can see it in many of our countries. You, you go to any of our countries, go to Angola. When there is investment, what we call foreign direct investment, 95% it will be from Portugal. You go to Equatorial Guinea, is the same. Same. You go to Cote d'Ivoire, it is the same. We may deny it, but it's the truth. Can I? <laughs> and then the question of the boundaries. The boundaries, Nkrumah warned us, and, and I think that Nkrumah and, and those who are there were simply saying, all these things that we have created called countries are artificial. And somebody, I think, put it very well. I don't know whether it was Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni, that, and, and he was uh, just being melodramatic, but he made the point. He said that when they created Uganda with the Kenya-Uganda border, you, if you had a wife, you slept you are on both sides on, on, in, in a place, and the following day you woke up with your wife in Uganda and your husband in Kenya. And, and, and you have communities divided in that way. And if you are to start to redraw these boundaries, then there would be conflict. So he said, let us retain them. But we have seen that in the recent past, for some reason, we have created other countries. Out of Sudan, we now have South Sudan. And you could also see the very deliberate act of the colonizer, that almost on the eve of independence, the countries were put together. Nigeria, almost on the eve of independence, the countries were put together. In Cameroon, which is now a problem, and, and it allows me, Cameroon allows me to tell you how the neo-colonial countries still work. Only two days ago, I think there was a vote on the issue of Cameroon. Everybody acknowledges that what is happening in the southern Cameroons is something that ought to have the world attention. See who voted against it. France with the rest of the other countries. All the other permanent members and others voted in favor of the right thing. But France chose a position that is in support of the current administration for good reason. And see how Southern Cameroon is defined to tell you how the neo-colonial project works. Francophone and Anglophone. If you go to the so-called Anglophone, I suspect that 95% of the population cannot speak English, but they are defined as Anglophone. You go to the francophone, 95% of the, they cannot say anything beyond we and no, but they are defined as francophone. 
In other words, even the manner in, you ask, see even right now, which continent is defined in, 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 in linguistic terms? It is Africa, Anglophone, Lusophone, Francophone. And I'm submitting, therefore, that the whole idea of boundaries was let us do the best. And that is why Kwame was saying, let us unite, because when you, we unite, then we dissolve the boundaries. The boundaries simply become administrative and they don't become things that would lead us to war. And I look forward to the day that that will be achieved so that we have these uh, uh, porous boundaries where I don't, I fly to, to Rwanda one, and, one hour and 30 minutes, I have a different currency. I go to Uganda 25 minutes, I have a different currency. I go to Sudan, I have another, all other currency. And that is why 55 of us, the 1.5 billion of us, all our country currencies are, are not defined. If they are not hard, then they must be soft. All our currencies are soft currencies. <laughs> Systems and changes. You've talked about the changes that we have seen in the last few years. It is now in the public domain that the first coup d'etats that were mounted in Africa were at the behest of the erstwhile colonizers. We know. Lude de Vet, he's not a Congolese, has written that Patrice Emery Lumumba was murdered at the behest of the Belgians. We know that Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown at the behest of, of, of the, the Americans and the British. We know that Silvanus Olympia was eliminated at the behest of the, of the French. We know. Because these, we know that Modibo Keita of Mali was eliminated at the behest of France. In much more recently, we know that Thomas Sankara was eliminated at the behest of the French. We know all these. And it is because if anybody emerges who is articulating a vision which is in danger of compromising the pernicious role of these erstwhile colonizers, then he has to be neutralized. These are contentious views. But there are views that are there nevertheless. And then, of course, we know that there were proxy wars that were being fought. Everybody knew, for example, that Mobutu Sesseko was running something that was improper. But it was in the interest of certain powers, which are not African, that Mobutu remains. We know that Jean Bedel Bokassa was running something that was not proper. But it was in the interest of certain powers that he remains. And in, we are therefore saying that it took the people themselves, and this brings me to the final limb of this question, it, is, it took the people themselves to begin to liberate themselves from such method. It took Meles Zenawi in Ethiopia to overthrow the system. It took Paul Kagame and RPF to solve the problem in Rwanda. It took Yoweri Museveni to solve the problem. It took Robert Mugabe to solve the problem. It took uh, uh, Samora Marshall. It took Agostino Neto. Because the people are now saying, nobody is going to solve our problems. We've got to solve our problem. The tragedy is, the leaders of the revolution ended up being the abusers of the revolution. And that is where we now find ourselves when the people are now coming up. The Arab Spring is a product in my assessment. And I may be mistaken of the people saying, you have betrayed us. And if you see what is happening in Khartoum, they are saying, no, this time round, we are not going to do what they did in Egypt, leaving the street too early. We want to leave the streets only when we are guaranteed that we, the civilians, will be in control because you, the men and women in uniform, have cheated us once before. And therefore, they are saying the people are the guarantors of power, that power springs from the people, not from the barrel of the gun, a la Mao. And therefore, you can see, therefore, in the recent past, even when the armed forces are taking over power in what I call velvet coup d'etats, as we saw in Mugabe's uh, in, uh, Zimbabwe, they don't want to call it a coup. It has all the ingredients of a coup, but nobody calls it a coup. Nobody calls it a coup, but you know it is a coup because you want to have the people behind you. I think that is a good thing. The African people is now beginning to assert, uh, the African peoples are now beginning to assert themselves and the leaders are now beginning to recognize that they hold their positions in trust for the people. And I think that that is a good thing. They are the guarantors of, 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 of leadership and, and going forward, that is good uh, for, 
for sustainable peace in terms of, uh, uh, I see you are impatient, but there is a last point I'll make. Yes. The last point I'm going to make is the thing called democracy. If you look at successive elections in Africa, turnouts are becoming lower and lower. The most recent election in South Africa, you've seen the turnout has gone down. And I look at the young people saying, why did you not vote? You say, there is nothing to vote for. In other words, something must happen. When you find young people are saying there is nothing to vote for, we must be very worried because the mandate you are getting through that process is a questionable mandate. And this is what leads me to my last point. We must have a system where the critical majority of the people are involved in the process. And this is not from me. Kenya's Ali Mazurui did a documentary in 1980s, which I commend to all of us who love Africa. Africa, the triple heritage. And the, the line that I think is one is the piece de resistance is this. He said, Africa produces what it does not consume and consumes what it does not produce. And I'm suggesting to us that even in matters democracy, we must begin to consume what we generate from within our ranks for the sake of sustainable peace. I know what I've said may not enjoy unanimity, <laughs> but I think it should uh, annoy people in a constructive way to begin thinking in some useful direction. Thank you. Can I, can, can I uh, just yeah, make yes. one point? Yeah. The, I'd like to urge <laughs> the professor to remove the Commonwealth from his neo-colonialist <laughs> architecture. <laughs> and, <laughs> and let me explain why. He is entirely right that when the Commonwealth was set up, it was to mask Britain's decline as an imperial power. And remember, it was a British prime minister who came to South Africa to talk about the winds of change uh, blowing across Africa, a very important speech by Harold Macmillan. So it was designed, and the titles, as you rightly say, are different from Ambassador, to mask that. But it isn't anymore. And uh, the next year, the big Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting will take place in Kigali. At the moment, the team that the President has set up uh, is working with the Commonwealth Secretariat in London, which is independent of the British government, to decide what will be discussed and how the conference will be run. And, and the Commonwealth has become a genuine family of nations in which Britain is not the leader. And although, as you rightly say, Prince Charles, who is the heir apparent in Britain, has been elected as head of the Commonwealth by Commonwealth leaders, it was by no means certain that he would be. And it was last year that the Commonwealth leaders got together when he was not in the room, Britain was not in the room, and decided that they would like him to be their head. So, so I would just urge you to, to, to uh, you know, Rwanda has decided that they want to join the Commonwealth for, for very good reasons, and which is it is a great club of people who share a common set of values. <laughs> Consider that. <laughs> after, after, after Kigali, I'll, I'll, I'll consider. <laughs> but, but he's absolutely right about the French. The French... The, <laughs> the, 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 the Francophonie is about the French having their hands on what is happening in Africa. And indeed, some of their former colonies have representation in the French Assemblée Nationale. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've lived next door to the French for many thousands of years, so we know the French very well. And, and you, know, you know the French uh, too, but it's a very different setup in the Francophonie to the setup in the Commonwealth. Thank you very much, Honorable <laughs> Mitchell. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Major Gabarin, Nigerian Army student. So my question is to Professor Lumumba. Sir, in your presentation, you made mention of uh, how Africans were able to come out of our diversity strong this, against all odds. So, sir, in line with the vision of our past leaders like uh, Kwame Nkrumah about achieving a united Africa. So, what do you think is the reason that is hampering the unity of Africans to achieve one united strong and indivisible Africa. What do you think is the reason that is hampering us? Thank you, sir. 
Very quickly, number one, uh, the <coughs> question of uh, the chiefs. Traditional systems. It is true that traditional systems are inherently, some of them are in inherently very, uh, very dictatorial and do not allow participation. But what is important is to recognize that progressively the African peoples are becoming very assertive. And I can say without fear of contradiction that the safety of what we define as democracy demands that the people are eternally vigilant. And if people are vigilant, then those who are in positions of authority will know that if they don't take the right, make the right moves, then the people will rise, they'll remain in the streets, and they will not leave the streets until they themselves leave. And I think that is beginning to happen in a number of African countries. As to models, these are very young countries after many African countries, after we regained our independence, we are very young. But one can begin to see, and I agree with the Honorable Minister here, he says that the people of Rwanda are beginning to lay a foundation for another, for a model, which is uniquely Rwandan. And I believe that that is something that we can begin to celebrate. Ethiopia, despite her problems, is also beginning to lay a foundation. Tanzania, one can cite. So from Africa, one is beginning to see that models are coming out. They are going to go through their trials and tribulations, but is it not through those trials and tribulations that they grow stronger? Second and lastly on the question of African unity. I believe that achieving African unity is now much more difficult than it was 50 years ago, but it's going to happen. Not in your lifetime, not in mine, perhaps in 100 years. And I can begin to see the building blocks. When people meet in Kigali and they talk about the African continent free trade area, one is beginning to recognize that when you begin to trade and Rwanda DRC becomes much more important via trade to Rwanda and Burundi and Central African Republic, in 50 years time, then those boundaries are going to be dissolved and they are going to become irrelevant except for purpose of administration. And one can see the question of the free skies. One is beginning to talk about an African currency. We are beginning to talk about an African passport. This is not for the faint-hearted. It's not for those who want instant coffee solutions. It is for those who look to the future and to the next generation rather than tomorrow. A hundred years' time is my projection about African unity in the manner that we desired. Thank you.